Unmounting the second circuit board turned out to be about as much fun as I expected. Very similar to the predictors. Had to unwrap quite a few wires. I put labels on them so hopefully I can put them back in the right place. Also took plenty of reference photos. And I think I finally have it completely extricated. In some cases, like here, I found it actually easier to just unsolder the stakes and leave the wires wrapped around them. Because in this case, there's a capacitor attached, and the wires wrapped around like below the capacitor and it's soldered on. It just seemed like way too much of a pain to try getting it out. And let's see. I think it's completely free now. Hey, and a couple wires going to the control. I think vertical hold on the front. I found it easier just to leave the wires, or rather to detach the wires from the control and leave them attached to the board. A couple screws. So, here we can see uh, how the tubes are actually inserted on the foil side and then all the components are on this side. There's one capacitor that I managed to replace while it was still attached to the chassis and that's when I decided that that was just way too much of a hassle. And uh, it'd be better if I just removed the whole board. So that's what I've done. So I'm going to replace all of these maroon type capacitors. Kind of an interesting name on the parts list here. Something I don't think I've come across yet. They call them Durez. Durez Dip. And that's what all those brown capacitors are. Let's see. We got one electrolytic here. That'll go. And. Uh, I'll chuck the resistors. Actually, what I'll probably do is what I did on this board, which is just end up replacing most of the resistors. Because if you want to check them really accurately, you need to lift up one end of the resistor. And by the time you've done that, it's not much more effort to just remove it and pop a new one in. And, uh, you know, resistors only cost a few pennies, so why not? So hopefully that won't take too long to do. Uh, I might replace these power resistors up here. I think I've got some new ones on hand. Not that uh, these are necessarily bad, but I like the more modern flame-proof type power resistors better. And then these, there's the electrolytics. Huh, I'm not quite sure what these things are. I haven't quite seen anything like that before. Some metal posts. And there's some connections at the other end. Oh, those are the fuse holders. Okay, cool. I knew this set was fused, but I didn't know where the fuses were. So it's an early type of fuse holder. I'm, I'm guessing these pop out somehow. I can feel they're spring-loaded. Huh. Yeah. I'll just leave them alone because they are still good. Alright, then there's that electrolytic to replace. And then there or some hiding back here, so those are the cans I'm going to restuff. Hopefully this won't take too much longer. You may have noticed that I have a new light in my workbench. It's an LED light. They were selling these at the Menards. It's a, a home improvement chain of stores. I think this was $6. Uh, my friend speculated that maybe they were dumping them because there's going to be a better model coming out. I don't know, but this works pretty good really helps illuminate areas and uh, unlike a halogen light it produces virtually no heat I finished recapping the IF board and now before I reinstall it I want to tackle the electrolytics especially this guy down in here because it's more accessible now with this board out of the way and uh, might as well get these two guys too should be fairly easy. This is just, I think, a single electrolytic axial type. I can't read the label yet. I'll have to get it out of there to see what exactly is going on there. And then these two are pretty readily accessible, especially this one because it's not it's just attached by a strap. But it's pretty loose in there right now. Now for the fun part. I've got the board completely recapped, new resistors installed, and now I have to wire it back in. 
hopefully I've labeled everything sufficiently and taken enough reference photos and won't be too much of a challenge. I finished installing the board and I double triple checked all my wiring and here's one rebuilt electrolytic. So the only thing left is to rebuild or restuff this three section guy here. But before I do that I'm going to try powering this set back up. So I got my little Tusk CRT, Tusk speaker, and I guess that's that. So let's see if this still works after all the work I did on that, all the wires I had to reattach. Tubes are lighting up good. Through 150 watt bulb in series, just uh, for paranoia's sake. It's probably going to be starving at too much power for it to actually work though. No, I do hear a little bit of static. Alright, well, it appears there's no dead short, so I'll go ahead and take that bulb out of this the circuit. Okay, now for a full power test. Alright. Yoke's crooked, but that's no big deal. It's static. Excellent. Mm -hmm. There's sound. We'll hook up an antenna, see if we get an actual picture out of this stuff. Alright, let's see what we get now. The better signal source. Yoke slip back. Try it again. Just in height and linearity and so on. Try a different channel. This reception just stinks, so I suspect with all the work I did that uh, the alignment's way off now. Plus, I have not checked the tubes yet. And uh, there are there are multiple like six AU sixes for example. I don't know if I put them back in the original same original sockets. But it works. That's the important thing. The reception can certainly be improved with tweaking. I noticed kind of a burning smell after this. I've been playing for about 15 minutes. So I just turned it off and went poking around. And I noticed that big power resistor here, 
quite toasty whereas the ones over here are barely even warm and the tubes, some of the tubes seem to be awfully hot too so I think something is slightly amiss here which is going to be tough to track down because the set more or less works. <laughs> Those are the toughest problems to track down. Uh, I guess a voltage check would be the uh, most straightforward thing to try. Assuming that in the service info I do have a voltage chart somewhere. On the pages I've printed out so far, I don't think I do that. Oh, they had to run the schematic, okay. I checked the voltage across the big 7 watt power resistor that was getting kind of toasty and it was actually pretty much dead on and if you do a little math that resistor normally kicks out about 3.5 watts so um, I think that's fine, so I decided to go ahead and start testing the tubes, and I popped in the first 6AU6, and boy, that sure doesn't look good. <laughs> Those are the short indicator lights. That's one of the reasons I really like this Cardmatic tester, uh, when you're testing a bunch of tubes especially, is that it checks for all the shorts simultaneously, you don't have to rotate a switch and check for it. So yeah, I think this 6AU6 has seen better days. So I'm hoping my problems are just related to some bad or weak or shorted tubes. Let's try the next 6AU6. And these are pretty old and grungy looking 6AU6s and they're GE branded so these might be the originals. Oh, the nice thing about the Cardmatic too is you don't have to flip, flip a bunch of switches and when you're testing a whole bunch of like all the tubes in a TV at once it's kind of handy to be able to just pop in a different card and not to flip a dozen switches and controls like I do with the 600A. Other thing I really like about this is the test for leakage. So right now if that needle crept up without me touching anything that means it's got leakage. This one's just up a little bit. And I know there aren't any shorts so I just go right ahead and go right to quality. And yeah, this is a pretty good tube. So one good, one bad so far. So last of the three 686s. Looks like no shorts or leakage in this one either. And quality's pretty good. So it might just all come down to that one, two with intermittent shorts. Luckily 6AU6s are common as dirt so I was quickly able to find a very good replacement. Now I've switched to testing a 6CB6 which is the third IF stage. And what do you know, we've got a short on this tube as well. Luckily that's also a very common tube and I know I've got some good replacements on hand. So between the bad 6AU6 and the bad 6CB6 that'd be the first or second and the third IF stage is being problematic. That would definitely affect the gain, I would think. Well, the bad tubes just keep coming. I'm testing the 6T8, which is used in the sound circuit. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, I've got decent sound. Well, this short tester is fairly sensitive, but I have calibrated mine. I can see there's a control for it right here. Now, what the short test means is it doesn't mean there's a dead short necessarily between two elements. What it might mean is there's a, a lower path of resistivity than there should be. Like a piece of junk generally is like falling loose inside the tube. You know, like maybe a little bit of the cathode emissive material is falling loose inside and it's forming a path of conduction between the plate and some other element. So the tube may kind of work even if there is a short, but I'm sure it's not working as well as it could be. So I'll go hunt for a good 6T8.
Now I'm checking the 6CU5 audio output tube and check out that leakage well into the bad range. I'll check the quality for the heck of it, but I'm definitely going to replace it. So it tests well into the good, and that's why I really like this tester. Testing leakage on something like the 600A Hickok tester, it's a little bit of a uh, subjective test. I believe the idea is as you, as you rotate the switch test, you see how the needle, needle deflects and there's a way you can kind of guesstimate for leakage. But this has it built in. And that can be quite important with certain TV tubes. Probably not so much the audio output tube, but certainly tubes like in the IF stages, very sensitive to leakage. So, yeah, this tube probably works all right, but I think I will dig one up as well. 6CU5, fairly common. I expect I've got one on hand. So there's a replacement though. It does appear to be an RCA. I bet this thing gets driven pretty hard though, so I'm not really surprised there's some leakage. Now the one big downside to the Cardmatic tester is I don't have cards for all the tubes. In fact, I seriously doubt there were cards ever made for every tube type there is. So, I've gone back to the 600A to test some tubes like the 6CY5. And for this, they indicate to press down P1 and P4, and what do you know, it's really weak. This is a tube that's in the tuner. I think it's the RF amp. So that will have to go. I'm really astounded at how many of these tubes are weak or bad, yet this set was still producing an image. I've moved on now to the 6CL8. Here's the original. Well into the replace region. Did some digging around. Found what I believe is a new old stock tube. Hopefully that'll do the trick. Also dug up a 6C5 audio output tube, I hope is good. 6CY5, I hope is good. Which only leaves one more I have not been able to track down yet. The 6CX8. I'll dig more into my stash. I'm pretty sure I've probably got one somewhere. Shirts. Oh, that's much better. I was starting to doubt my tube tester actually for a while because all the tubes are testing so weak until I pulled, pulled out a few uh, new old stock and they all tested well into the good just like this. What I'm starting to suspect is that after the pitcher tube died, somebody may have kept playing that set just for sound and just drove it into the ground. Uh, only one other time that I can think of that I find a set with so many bad or nearly weak tubes and that was a theory floated by some guys online about that set as well as that somebody just kept watching and kept playing it even as the picture crapped out and just just to listen to it I've installed all the good tubes most new old stock otherwise used but that's very good except for the 6CX8 which is a combination clipper and video amp I'll uh, keep digging around for one, but in the meantime, I want to see what difference these tubes would make. So here we go. Oh yeah. That is a whole lot better. Glad I didn't waste any more time screwing around with voltage checks and whatnot. I imagine after a little alignment tweaking, it's going to be rock solid. That reminds me, there's something else I haven't actually tried on this set yet, and that is UHF reception. We still have a few low power over the air UHF broadcasts. I want to see if I can dial those in. I think 
UHF is when this points straight up, and then you use the fine tuning to dial it in. That yellow wire is not much of an antenna, but it may just do the trick. Let's see. It's been a while since I tuned the UHF band on a vintage TV, so I'm not sure what else out there. Also, I haven't tested the uh, one tube in the UHF tuner yet. If it's anything like the others, it's probably weak too. Yeah, well, I didn't pick up anything. This is the UHF tuner. It was an option. This is the VHF tuner. And these are the two tubes I just replaced. Tube for the UHF tuner is tucked down inside here. I believe it's a 6AF4. You can hear a little difference in the static as I tune around. Here's the 6AF4 I found installed in the UHF tuner. When I went to look for a replacement, I found a 6AF4A. Look how much shorter it is. I'm guessing this is an improved version. Dimensions are of paramount in this tube because it's made to operate at very high frequencies. You see it's got pretty small tube elements down in there. So I'll pop this in see if it makes any difference. I installed the smaller tube, but still had no reception. Then I went over and looked at the cabinet and discovered that the UHF position is actually like this, not straight up. Straight up is 13. So it goes 13, then UHF, then channel 2. Still had nothing though. So then I put the original tube back in. And now, it seems a little more promising. All right, good old analog UHF broadcast. They are still out there. It's my understanding that when I tune and I hear kind of a rush of static, that's actually a, a modern digital transmission. Oh, there's another analog station. Barely coming in. I'm manipulating the antenna a little bit. Later on I'm going to dig out a uh, good vintage bow tie antenna that I've been told is a really good design and see how well that works. Trying to pick something up there. Hmm, not sure what that is. All right. So, anyways, cool. So that's working quite well. Can't wait to get this back in the cabinet with that new picture tube and the big old speaker. Tonight's stars, Bob Peters, Patrick McNee, and Denise Nicholas. One out of twelve, one out of twelve. This is Adam Twelve. It stars Martin Milner as Officer Pete Malloy, Kent McCord as Officer Jim Reed. One out of twelve, Roger. This black and white patrol. I was unable to locate a good 6CX8 replacement, however I looked in a tube substitution guide and found that a 6GN8 was pretty darn close, so I popped one of those in there. Sets 
playing fine, but there is one issue I have not resolved yet. Left side of the screen is brighter, a little bit of a wavy line down the center. Especially noticeable when you change channels. On this digital box, which gives you a blank image for a while. So, my first thought there might be something wrong with the high voltage like flyback circuitry. I, I tried swapping out the damper tube, for example. That's that guy right there. Made no change whatsoever. Then it occurred to me, maybe it's because I'm still running on these three original electrolytics. Now, the main filter one must be working to some extent. We'd have all kinds of horrible problems like humming the audio. But uh, maybe one of the other two suctions is a little bit leaky and not doing its job properly. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to restuff the can right now, but I will tack in the replacements just in this general area to see if that uh, takes care of the problem. I know this looks horrible, but here are the four new Rubicon caps installed. Later I will either restuff that can or mount these in a much neater and safer configuration, but for now this will do. So, did it make any difference? Let's find out. Nuts. No, it did not. Still have that problem where this side is brighter. So I'm just going to have to keep plugging at it. Got a suggestion online it might be that the horizontal blanking circuitry is not working properly. So that's somewhere to start. I know older sets had a horizontal drive adjustment, but I don't believe this set does. The older sets to be a variable capacitor on the grid of the horizontal output tube. Um, but I can certainly check the voltages in this area. But I assume the problem's somewhere down in this section. So I can check the waveforms, check the voltages, you know, maybe some of these capacitors that I left in. There's some ceramic caps down there. Those might be bad. Who knows? It's frustrating though because it's so close to being done. I mean, now I have to <laughs> keep plugging away to find this, figure out this one final issue. If anybody has any thoughts, please leave a comment.